I go to the men's group on Tuesday mornings, and it's a very good uh, uh, sense of fellowship we have studying the Lord's Word and how to apply it to our lives, and uh, it's very helpful for all of us. It's very refreshing, and it is a sense of community. As you get older, uh, you have fewer uh, close friends, um, and so to have a men's group allows you to connect with men. Uh, the fellows are, are funny and interesting and become family. It means a lot. It gives me encouragement. Also gives me a chance to get deeper into the Word of God by studying with the men. It sets my tone for the week, the month, and, and the future. So. I love everyone here. I'm new to the area, and I was one of the things I was looking for was a place where I could fit in. Um, Shoreline has been that in significantly, but in more particular, this group. As soon as I came, it's I've never been in a small group. I've enjoyed people more, and uh, look forward to coming each week. Well, I've been part of the group for about five and a half years, and I've only missed one day. Uh, the men have grown close, and this is a type of discipleship for me. The men's group is, has been very impactful in my life. It's been really refreshing. In the past few years, I've become kind of isolated. Um, although I am on a city council, so I am involved in the community um, in those ways. Not kind of in a more of a detached way, whereas this is a personal time, and then afterwards we go and have coffee, which is kind of carries on, so it's a uh, cherished, it's a cherished time, I really love it. Really? Men, men get up early and get together and study the Bible and have community? I mean, those are just actors, those aren't real people, right? I mean, that's... That's going on? Yeah, not just the Tuesday, Wednesday Bible study, but other men's Bible studies around the community and women's Bible studies and classes and small groups and community groups and all kinds of things that are happening. God's people gather together in community because we know that we is greater than me. It's great being who you are. It's great being who I am, but there's something about us together that does something for the kingdom of God, for the work of Jesus and in our own hearts that we would miss if we weren't walking in community. And we do this because Jesus modeled it. When you read the Bible, when you read the Gospels, here's what you learn. Jesus really did love people, and they were drawn to community with him. Jesus loved people. He enjoyed being around them, and they were drawn to him to walk in community. And if anybody didn't need community, it was Jesus. I mean, he's God Almighty. He's the, he's the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He exists eternally in community. He doesn't need community but he longed for it. And if our goal for our lives is to be more like Jesus, we have to think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, and live like Jesus. And that means we discover the impact and the power of consistent community and what it is to walk together. We also know that community can be tough, but it's worth getting past the barriers and finding the joy and value of consistent community. Last week, Pastor Sean talked about just some of the challenges and barriers, but stepping past those into community. And I got to be part of the Shoreline community last week from out of the country. I got to follow the service online, and, that's, and that, that our online service is really people out of the country, out of the area, or very, very ill. Otherwise, it's good to be together here in community. But, and it was great also for me to know that before last Sunday, I think going back before Christmas, I think I preached nine out of 10 of the previous sermons back through Christmas, Christmas Eve, going all the way back. But when I'm not here to know that I have a community of preachers who also preach God's word here at Shoreline Church. And that, that we do that in community, to hear different voices and different ways of bringing God's word is part of what makes the church strong because we is greater than me. And, and, and so what I wanna talk about today is this idea that how community when we walk in, you know, one of the seven markers of Christian maturity, and, and those, are, those seven markers aren't a menu we choose from, they're a recipe that we follow and build into our lives. One of those seven markers that make us mature and strong as Christians is consistent community. And, and there's something that actually, there's something massive and huge and world-changing that comes, that comes out of our community that I want to talk about today. And it's really this cause and effect. If we live and walk in community the way God wants us to, there's this thing that will happen. If this, then that. You all understand cause and effect. 
right? I mean, so, so I can, I'll give you a cause, the if, you give me the effect, the then, what happens? In your, just in your mind, answer this question. If I eat too much spicy food late at night, then, answer that in your mind. You go, oh, it could be a long night of no sleep. It could be, have you ever woke up with a food hangover? You know what I'm You wake up, you go, oh, well, I should not have had that last, you know, it, it, there, there's a then to that if. If I never exercise, if I'm never active, if I never exercise, then there's results, there's, there's consequences, there's, there, there's cause and effect. How about this? If I tend and care for my garden, this is kind of springtime coming up, if I start to get the ground ready, plant the seeds, if I do that, then you, know, you get something beautiful. You get the result of the if. That's how life works. If I speak well of other people, then generally speaking, they'll talk well of me. It's really true. I learned this from my wife, Sherry, and her mom. This is a picture of Sherry and her mom, Joan. And, uh, and, Sherry, and Sherry's mom is one of the most gracious people I've ever met. She's loved Jesus from her childhood. She loves Jesus so passionately. And she taught Sherry growing up. She says, honey, if you speak well of people, and you speak kindly of people, for the most part, they're gonna speak well of you, if, then. She also, her mom said, and if you gossip and talk bad about people, then there's other results. And if you were to ask Sherry, tell me how many times you heard your mom speak poorly of other people. She would probably tell you she can't think of a single occasion her whole life. But if you ask her, how many times did you hear people speak badly of your mom? She'd say, almost never. And Sherry learned that lesson, seeks to live that. And I actually didn't learn that growing up. I learned that when I got married and had to kind of rethink. There's ifs and there's then. How about this one? If you come to the cross of Jesus Christ and confess your sins and offer them to Jesus, then you become the righteousness of God. We were just thinking about that. It's this amazing thing. If you come to the cross and confess your sins and cry out to Jesus to forgive you and take his hand to follow him, then your sins, he takes them on himself and he who knew no sin becomes sin. He takes your sin and buries it in the deepest sea and you get the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate if then. And here's another one. If we live and walk in community with each other as Christians, with other Christian churches, with people who don't yet know Jesus, if we walk in consistent, loving community, listen closely, then the world will see Jesus. And the world will be drawn to Jesus. One of the reasons we grow in Christian community is it's the best way to show the world that Jesus is alive and he's real. So I want to look at four different ways that the Bible kind of unfolds that reality. And four different ways to walk in community that can show the world the love of Jesus. Here's the first one. When Christians are in authentic community with each other and they love each other, the world notices and is drawn to Jesus. When, when people who don't yet know Jesus, watch people who do know Jesus, actually love each other and walk in loving, caring community, the world notices. And when we don't love each other, guess what? The world notices that too. Now, how do I know that, that, that one of the ways that God shares his love with the world is by the way Christians love each other? I know it because the Bible tells me this. In John chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you have your Bible app, you can just punch in John 13, 34, and following. And what's happening in John 13, and, and you have to understand that, that kind of the, the storyline here, in John chapter 13, uh, Jesus is sitting around the table with his disciples. It's the last meal he's going to share with them. It's the last supper. And at that table, Jesus breaks the bread, and he says to his disciples, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. He takes the cup and he pours the cup and he says, this is the new blood of the covenant, my blood shed for you. And he, and he, he prophesies his body broken, his blood shed. Then he gets up from the table and he washes their feet one by one. That's, that's the table that, that Jesus is sitting at. And then Judas leaves the table and Jesus teaches. And so in John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus is teaching around the table after breaking the bread, after pouring out the cup, and after washing their feet. And he says this in verse 34. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you. So you must love one another. I mean that's community. That's deep love. How do we love each other? The way Jesus loved us. Guess, everybody look at me. That's a lot of love. It's more love than I have. 
And look at verse 35. Here's the then. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That everyone is the whole world. Jesus says, if you want the world to know that you're my disciples, if you want the world to know that I'm alive, that you're my followers, you're my people, he said, love each other. Walk in community. That's the call of Jesus. Our beliefs, our doctrines, those are important. We can share those as we have relationship, but they've got to see us love each other. And if the world watches Christians who don't love each other, they're going to kind of go, do I want to be part of that community? But if the world watches Christians who love each other, not just in their own church, but around the world, Christians of every background and every, every, just if they love, Christians love each other, it sends a message to the world. So here's the question. What can I do to love the believers around me like Jesus loves me and like Jesus loves them? Okay, if I show the world that Jesus is alive and real by the way I love other Christians, by the community I have with Christians, what do I do? Here's a couple thoughts. Extend grace lavishly. Forgive quickly. How, how can you forgive her after what she did? How could you ever forgive her after what she did? Because I'm a Christian. And the world is baffled. The world doesn't understand. But because you've received the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, you can forgive. And it shows the world how we love. Forgive, extend grace lavishly. Share generously. Why, why, would, you, why would you give money to, you know, th this church, we turn on the lights every week because you guys give. We have ministries because people give. Why would you give? Why would you be generous? Because I believe in the community of God's people within the church. I believe in what God is doing in the church. So, so grow in, in generosity. Bless publicly. You want to show the world that Jesus is real with other Christians, the Christians around you? Bless them. Speak words of blessing often, consistently, out loud, publicly. It sends a message of hope to a world that desperately needs hope. I remember for three and a half years, I was a teaching pastor. I, I, I had three and a half years where I stepped out of being a senior pastor of a church. I'd been a senior pastor for many years. I stepped out of that role before I came to Shoreline. For three and a half years, Sherry and I were writing the Organic Outreach books, and we were praying that ministry, but I spoke at three different locations. I was a teaching pastor in three locations. One was Grand Valley State University. So for three and a half years, every, twice a month on Sunday evenings, I would preach to this big bunch of college students. And I remember the last... The last chapel of one of the years, this young woman had finished, she'd, I'd been there about two and a half years, and she came and she said, I want you to know that yours and Sherry's relationship has given me hope that maybe I could find a man who loves Jesus and could love me and I could have a healthy marriage. She said, I never had that hope before. But, and, and here's the thing, I looked at this young woman, I didn't know her name, I hadn't met her, she'd been there at the chapel, but there's hundreds of kids there. But she'd been watching Sherry and I. And she noticed how often I spoke of my wife and my love for her and my respect for her and my appreciation and my words of blessing gave her hope. You want to show the world that you're a Christian, speak well of other Christians. And if you have really nasty, bad things to say, I'm trying to say a pastoral way to say this. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> be careful. Be careful with your mouth. Bless publicly. And, and then serve humbly. But when you serve other Christians in the name of Jesus, when you serve with the heart of Jesus, those of you that, that serve our children and children's ministry here and serve with our youth and serve, when you serve, it shows the presence of Jesus. The world will know we are Christians by the way we love one another. And, and there, there, how many of you growing up, if you grew up in church, I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't know church songs growing up, but um, anybody remember a little song? If you know, you can sing along with me. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Anybody you remember that one? It's right, it's just ripped off right from the Bible. <laughs> and they'll know you're a Christian. How? By the way you love each other. Let's win the world to Jesus by loving each other. That's one of the ways we do it. The second thing you see in the scriptures is when local congregations love, serve, and pray for, and partner with other churches, the world notices and is drawn to Jesus. When churches love other Christian churches in their community, when churches pray for other churches, partner with other churches, celebrate other churches, the world looks on and goes, oh, they're on the same team. They love each other. But when churches don't like other churches, when churches feel like they're in competition and speak poorly of other churches, oh, they have a lot of people coming to their church. They must not preach the Bible. 
really? I mean, I, I've heard so many things where that, but if we love each other, if churches love other churches, that, that sends a message. In John chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, turn to John 17. We're going to start in verse 20. John 17, 20. Uh, this is the longest prayer recorded in the Bible that Jesus prays. And the first part of the prayer, Jesus prays for his disciples, the immediate disciples that he's pouring his life into. But then he prays for you and for me. He prays for those who will believe in him through the ministry of the disciples, which going through all the generations, each of the disciples preached Christ, shared Jesus, and it's gone on from generation to generation. Jesus prays for you in John 17. So we read this in John 17, 20. Jesus says, he's praying. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, not just for my disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. And here's his prayer for you and for me. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus prays to the Father. May my people be united just like Jesus says, I'm united to the Father and the Father's united to me. How united is God the Father and God the Son? Here's the answer, the theological answer, really united. I mean, bound together. That's what he wants for us. Father, just as you are in me and as I am in you, may they also be in us. So, and so why should we be united? Listen to what it says. So the world may believe that you have sent me. See what it comes back to? The world. When Christians love other Christians, it sends a message to the world. And, and, and that means that we have got to be united with God's people all over the planet. Any Bible-believing, Christian, Jesus-loving church, whatever tribe, tongue, nation, or people group, that's the book of Revelation says, one day before the throne will be every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group. And we'll be, all be together. So now we better celebrate other Christian churches while we have a chance in this life. So here's the question. How can I pray for and celebrate other churches and other local ministries? How do I celebrate the other churches in the Monterey area or anywhere I travel in the world? Here's an idea. Pray while driving by or walking by other churches. If you're driving by or walking by another church, when I come, when I come from my house here, I drive by Cypress Church and I, and I pray for them. I come down Highway 68. I drive by Calvary Church on the right-hand side. And I know Nate, who's the pastor there. I know Ben, who's the pastor at, at, at Cypress Church. I come down, and then I go by the Nazarene Church. If I go past the church, if I turn it on. And so, I mean, there's just from my house to here, there's three different churches. Pray as you drive by. And, and, and if a church, if you see a church, and, there, and there's churches that have stopped following Jesus and stopped preaching the word, pray for them too. Pray God bring them back. God convict their hearts. God show them the truth. Because churches that compromise on the word of God end up going away. They just do eventually. And churches that preach Jesus will continue to thrive. So pray for churches that are preaching Jesus to grow stronger. Pray God bless that pastor, bless that, and be a person praying. Do drive by prayers, man. It's the best. Do walk by prayers. Share trustingly. Share with other churches. We as a church are committed to sharing with other churches and partnering with other churches. And, we, and, we, and we'll, part, we'll, we'll share things when a new church comes into town. We try to say, how can we help you? How can we bless you? I meet with pastors of new churches. They're going to plant new churches in the area. They'll call me. I'll meet with them and say, what can we do to help you? And, and they're, they, they're amazed. And, 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 and here's the problem. And this, this is why we share trustingly with other churches. Here's a little secret. Everybody ready? We're on the same team. <laughs> We're not competing against them. We're not fighting to get people to come to our church and not to go to their church. As a matter of fact, today, Pastor Keith, who's one of the people on our preaching team, will preach sometimes uh, here, Pastor Keith is not here today. Why is he not here? Because Pastor Keith is preaching at Lighthouse Baptist Church. What? He's playing for the other team? No. He's playing for Jesus' team. Can I get an amen? amen. Right? I mean, that's, that's how we have to think. We have a couple in our church uh, that, are, that are part of Shoreline Church, and they're still part of Shoreline Church, but in a different way. Uh, but John and Amy Eldridge, they've been part of Shoreline almost from the very beginning. John's a very gifted guitar player. Amy's got a beautiful voice and was one of our worship leaders that was a part of the worship team. But a few years ago, a church in Pacific Grove was really struggling, and they had lost their last person who actually had musical gifts, had left the church. They were down to like 50 or 60 people, and they called us and they said, do you have anybody that could come over for like a month or two and just lead worship for us? And I said, no way. You're not going to put our team members on your team. No way. You know, you can just suffer and die is what I said. <laughs> can I get an amen? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, good. So yeah, at least you're paying attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, what do we do? We got a team of people together to go over and lead worship for them for a couple months. 
and help them through that time. At the time, they were, they were called Mayflower Church. Now they're called Wellspring Church. And they're actually thriving and growing and health's come back to that church. But you know what happened? John and Amy stayed there. What? We lost a great guitar player and a great vocalist? No, they gained one. And God's kingdom goes on. And a couple of weeks ago, I saw John coming in here. And I said, hey, John, how are you doing? He goes, yeah, I got, a, I got a morning off from leading worship. So I'm just going to come show and just sit and enjoy it. And he, was just, and he was just so glad to be here. They're still part of this church because they're part of Christ's church, right? So we partner, we work together. That's what the church does. We share trustingly. I want to encourage you to look at the websites of some other churches, see what's going on and pray for them. I want to encourage you to pray for pastors of other churches. Here's three of my closest friends in the Monterey area. Three, there are three pastors. Uh, Pastor Ben on, on the left there is at Cypress Church and Pastor Mike is at Monterey Church and Pastor Tony is at Wellspring that used to be Mayflower Church. He's the one that stole two of our musicians. No. <laughs> Right? No, right? Um, but I meet with these guys on a regular basis. We pray for each other. We have each other's backs. We doctrinally hold, we hold the Bible together. Some, somebody says, well, I'm leaving Sh Shoreline because you don't like this or that. And I said, well, don't go to those churches either because they were all on the same page. Because you know why? Working out of the same book. Um, <laughs> but but these, are, these are brothers, not enemies. And, and, and listen to me. When the world sees that, it says something. Be because... The last time I checked, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love God's people. That's what we do. So pray for other churches. Love other churches. Remember their needs. I, I remember the needs of other local churches. You're like, well, how do I know the needs of other local churches? Because about 45 Sundays of the year, we pray for other local churches in our service. You might notice that in our prayer. We pray by name for the church and by name for the pastor and a specific need. Well, how do you know their needs? We call them, we ask them. And they tell us, and they're honored that we would pray for them. And that didn't start when I came here. When Howie Hugo was the pastor here, he started doing that. Because the founding pastor of the church also understood that we is greater than me. We're the church together. As a matter of fact, uh, Pastor Howie and I are going to be team preaching in March when we do our 35th anniversary. We're going to give you more detail coming up on our 35th anniversary. No, 25th. It's my 35th anniversary. <laughs> and 25th. But it seems like we just met yesterday, sweetie. So, what? Well, Watch and learn, gentlemen. Um, but uh, but uh, our 25th anniversary, and so Howie and I are going to team preach. And he's gonna, he lives down in Southern California. He and Linda are going to come up, and we're going to celebrate together what God's been doing. But that's, that's what the church does, because that's what we are. We're a body together. Number three, when Christians and congregations actively, humbly, and consistently serve the people in their community, the world notices and is drawn to Jesus. See, the way we love each other draws people to Jesus. The way we love other churches draws people to Jesus. But the way we love people who don't yet know Jesus and the way we serve them, that shows the world that God is alive and that Jesus is real and the church is serious about who God's called us to be. And, 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 so, and so we reach out and we serve and that shows the presence of Jesus. There's a gentleman who's part of this church and, and he's got a ministry he does. It's very quiet, very private and he, wouldn't, he, he would not, doesn't want to talk about it with other people but he goes out to different places where there's homeless folks in Monterey and he brings them some food. And he's gotten to know them. He just talks to them about Jesus and about what's happened in their lives and prays for them. And he goes to different places and just, just brings food. It's just a little ministry he does on his own pretty regularly. And, and so, he, so about once a year for the last three years, he's he says, hey, Pastor, do you want to come along and just bring food to people and just pray for people and around our community? So I've done that about once a year for the last three years with him. And it's, and it's beautiful. And it's powerful. And the last time we went out was a couple months ago. Last time I went with him, a couple months ago. And it was really neat because there's two really memorable moments. One was a woman, this, this younger woman, who said, um, and she was married, had a couple of kids, and then ended up homeless. And she's still, for a couple of years, she's lived in a, kind of lived on the streets and it's in a very tough time of her life. But when she found out I was the pastor of Shoreline Church, she said, oh, that's where I bring my kids for Christmas. She brings her kids to the Hope Christmas party. She says, because, you know, every year, I, the gifts I give them are gifts that you've given them because you put money in the offering plate and we buy gifts and we get gifts and every parent can come and get gifts for free and wrap them and give them to their kids, parents that are living in shelters and homes. Whatever got them there, we don't know, but we know right now that's where they are. She says, so I get, and then, then every Christmas, the last three Christmases, she says, then you have that dinner. They have a dinner right here in this room and, and her kids get to have Christmas dinner with their mom and then they get a picture of Santa Claus and they hear the story of Jesus and they get loved in the name of Jesus. And that, that's her, that was her story. And this was just before Christmas this last year. And I said, I said well, you know when that's coming? Oh, yeah, I'm going to be there with my kids for Christmas. That's, the, that's their Christmas. Shoreline puts it on for them. That's being the church. 
And then, and then another guy who I've met, I, 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 we bumped into the last three times I've been out with him. This guy's been living on the street for a long time. And, and he's all, he, he always says, he says, can I tell you a joke? Can I tell you a joke? And he said, I got a church joke for you. But you never know exactly what that means. And so uh, I said, okay, let me hear it. So he says, so it's kind of a Catholic church joke, but I, but I liked it, so I'm going to share it with you. So this is a, little, a joke I heard from a person on the street recently. And so he said, okay, okay, so this priest is driving along. He's driving along the road, and he's kind of weaving a little bit back and forth and not really going very straight. So this police officer hits the siren and pulls him over and, and looks inside. He says, oh, Father, Father, sorry, um, I just saw you sw- you're swerving and weaving on the road. And, and he looks over, and the, the priest has a glass in the holder there with some liquid in it. And he says, well, Father, what are you drinking there? He says, ah, it's just, just water, son, just, just, just water. He says, well, Father, can I see it? And because he holds it, he goes, well, it looks like wine and it smells like wine. And the priest says, he did it again. <laughs> um, so <laughs> some of you are going to tell that this week. Um, <laughs> if you don't know the backstory in the Bible, there's a story where Jesus turns water to wine. Check it out in the Gospel of John. Yeah, but anyways, um, I wouldn't have heard that joke had I not been out bringing sandwiches. But, the, but there's, something about, there's something about serving that shows the presence of Jesus. And so we read this in John 13, beginning of verse two. The evening meal was in progress. This is at the Last Supper. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And Jesus went on to say to them, this is how you're supposed to live. If I've done this for you, you should do this for others. Jesus said, live a life of humble service. So so for some of you, you might ask the question, how can I engage more in serving right here in Monterey? I mean, okay, so maybe I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, I'm part of the church, but I haven't taken that step into serving yet into that part of community and showing the world that God is real, that he loves them too. How do I take a step in? There's lots of ways. Right after the service, if you go out into the courtyard there, there's one of the booths is our community outreach booth. And there's five different ministries. You can just pick up the sheet at that booth. There's five different ministries. These are all, these, these are not like this kind of, this, it's not like this kind of stuff. I got to, oh, step into, oh, it's, I got to create this whole thing and make the, it's already there. These are like this, little step in. Just, so, so here you got, you've got feeding the homeless at Dorothy's Kitchen. You can be part of that. Food pantry, men's uh, clothing closet, women's clothing closet. That's three different ministries that happen right here on our campus twice a week. I help for women providing dinner and serving, bringing words of encouragement, second Wednesday of the month. And then women's shelter visits. All those people, women that are living in a shelter in a difficult time, all those are happening through Shoreline. It's already happening. It's already scheduled. All you have to do is pick this up or call in and say, when's it happening? And show up. That's not like a big giant step into community. That's just taking a little easy step. Any of us can do this. Make that decision that you're going to show the world that God is real by the way you love. And I want you to look at the screen. I want you to, it's, it's, it's not complicated. These are some of the kind of, kind of things we do. So we gather, this, this, is from our, this is from our Love Our Central Coast Day. And then we're partnered with churches from all over the community, serving all over the community. And you're looking just, just serving our community. Go to the next one there. And then, okay, raking, cleaning. This is one of our local schools. And just serving and caring. You go, oh, I could do that. Look at the next one. Okay, these are some of our young people that are serving people in need, people who are hungry. Go to the next one. Okay, this is, our, this is if you've seen the back, it says the back porch. And that's our back porch, and that's our, our, our men's clothing area there. And just people that come are in the need of clothes. They're maybe job-seeking, don't have nice clothes, or maybe the clothes they haven't worn out, and they need something, and we serve them that way. You could be on that team. Uh, just, just, this is right in down, you know, downtown Monterey, serving there. And then one more. And this is, I love this picture because you got teenagers, children, and adults all together serving in the name of just showing the world that God loves them too. And then retirement homes. Just we have people that go to folks that maybe they haven't been visited by somebody this week or this month, but Shoreline comes and just loves and talks with them and prays for them and cares for them. Every look about me for a minute. Just look up here for a second. It's just like this. It's just another step in. Find out what's going on. You don't, have to, you don't have to go make up a whole new ministry. We've got dozens of ministries. Just engage in what we're already doing and let you be in community with those who are hurting and broken. Show the presence of Jesus to the world. And then number four, when followers of Jesus love, connect with, and experience deep community with people who do not yet know Jesus, 
People notice and are drawn to the Savior. They're drawn to Jesus. We can go out and have community with, with, our, with people in need and serve them, but we can also just have community with non-believers just hanging out and doing life. There's a term that people have used called a Matthew party. You know what a Matthew party is? When you invite people over for a barbecue, for a hangout, and you invite people that know Jesus and love Jesus, and you invite people that don't know Jesus and don't follow him yet, and you let them hang out together. Because you know who's there along with them? Jesus. <laughs> He's present. And you get, and why, why is that called a Matthew party when you bring together people who are believers and people who are not? It's called a Matthew party from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Here's what we read. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Matthew was uh, basically stealing money from his own people. He was a hated person at that time. And he's in the tax thing. And Jesus says, follow me. He told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew left his life, followed Jesus, became a follower of Jesus Christ. First thing he does, I love this, verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Here's the picture. Matthew becomes a Christian. I want to invite all my friends. Well, there's this Jesus guy who I'm following and give my heart to. There's his disciples. I'll get them over. And I'll invite all the prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners from town, and we'll have a party together. Wouldn't you love to be a you know, fly on the wall at that party? Here's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and the worst of the worst from the community. But Matthew gets them all together because, because there's something that happens when people are together. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with them? Tax collectors and sinners. And I love this. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's the heart of Jesus. And we can bring people together. You have people in your life who know and love Jesus who are just warm, wonderful people. And you have people in your life who are wonderful people who don't yet know Jesus. Get them together. See what happens. That's what Alpha is. We have a ministry here called Alpha. This Thursday will be week three of Alpha. It's just bringing together people who don't yet know who Jesus fully is and want to learn, people who do love Jesus and know him, and bringing them together over a meal and over conversation and over a time of learning. And see what God does. And what God does is God draws people to himself. Because when people see Christian community, they long for what we have if we're living it out in front of them. And so here's a question. What might a Matthew party look like in my life, my home, my workplace, or my community? It might be just taking advantage of Alpha and bringing a non-believing friend with you and being part of that with them. It might be having some friends over to your house for a barbecue or for a, a dinner and, and not just inviting your church friends or your work friends, but bringing, inviting your friends from all walks of life and seeing what God does. And the big question, what might God do through us as we grow in consistent community? What could God do through a church like Shoreline if we will show community for each other and love each other, if we'll show community with other churches and love and pray for and partner with other churches, if we'll have community with those who are hurting and broken and come alongside of them and serve them, and if we'll have community with friendships with people who don't yet know Jesus. All of those things shine the light of Jesus and draw people to himself. So consistent community is not just for me. It's for the world and for you and for me and ultimately for the glory of God. So here's what I want to do as we close. I want to invite you to pray in one of three ways. I think these three categories will hopefully will reflect every person in this room, in the family worship venue, online. I think every, every one of us is in one of these three categories. So I want to pray three times over three different groups of people, all right, and ask you to pray with me. Here's the first group of people. You say, I've been in community, I've been part of the church, but with time, I've kind of just kind of faded out or stepped away, or maybe somebody hurt me, and I pulled away, and I'm kind of back here. And for some of you, here's, here's your step as we finish this series on consistent community. You're saying, I'm gonna take at least one baby step back into community. <laughs> I'm gonna do something. I've been, I pulled back, might have been engaged before, but I'm not now, and I'm gonna take my step in. And if that's you, pray with me. Lord Jesus, for those people who have been hurt in community and pulled away or maybe just have gotten busy or have just kind of fallen out of community and they may come to church on Sunday, but that's kind of it and there's not any other connection. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll stir their hearts to take that step back into community, to jump into a small group or, or to jump into a community group or to come to a class or to serve on a team and just build relationships with your people. Draw those folks who have pulled back and stepped away one step back into community, I pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. If that's you, hear that prayer and let God take, move you to take a step in these next week or so back into community. Second group of people, you'd say, I'm a Christian, I come to Shoreline Church, and I'm, part of, I'm in community, I'm involved in things, but I really feel like God's calling me to a deeper level of, I need mean, to step more into community. And I need to connect more in, in the body of Christ. I want the world to see that Christ is alive by how I live community out with other people. And you're ready to take that next big step into community. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, for those people who are engaged and part of the life of Shoreline. But there's a next step in community here at the church, a next step in community out there in the world that you want them to take. Give them the boldness, give them the courage, and let them hear your spirit draw them deeper in community, more consistent community in their lives. For your glory we pray, amen. And here's the third group of people. You would say, I come to Shoreline, I've been coming a short time or a long time, and, I, and I'm going to say this very specifically. You'd say, I'm part of the Shoreline family, but I'm not yet part of God's family. See, we have people that come to Shoreline that say, I like the church, I'm here, but I've not received Jesus Christ. Like that passage I read earlier, I haven't taken all my sins, and the righteous, one of Jesus, the righteous, righteous Jesus Christ on the cross died for my sins. I have not confessed my sins and given him my sins and let him give me his righteousness. I'm a part of the Shoreline family, but I'm not part of God's family through faith in Jesus. If that's you today, I want to invite you to not just be part of the Shoreline family, but to step into the family of God and to receive Jesus Christ today. And there were four people at the 830 service that they made that decision and prayed this prayer and that Sherry and I met with and we gave them, their, gave them a Bible and talked about their next steps of spiritual growth. And I want to give you a chance to make that decision also. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, for those who are gathered here who have not yet fully understood what you did on the cross for them or have not yet received it. Lord, speak to their hearts. If that's you right now, just listen, listen simply to the message of Jesus. Jesus wants you to know that he came to this earth, the righteous, perfect one of God, the sinless lamb of God. He came to this earth and died on a cross to take away your sins and to wash you clean. And if you will confess your sins to him right now, all your sins, if you'll give them to him and accept his forgiveness and accept his friendship and accept his leadership in your life, if you'll take his hand and say, I accept your forgiveness, I also take your hand and I will follow you all the days of my life into eternity. If you're ready to do that today, I wanna ask you to pray to him right now. Would you just in your heart quietly, would you say, dear Jesus, I need your forgiveness I confess all my wrongs to you. My wrong thoughts, my wrong words, my wrong actions. I give you all my sins, all my wrongs. And Jesus, I accept your righteousness. I accept your forgiveness that when you died on the cross, you did it for me in my place for all of my sins. And Jesus, I thank you that you took my sin and I thank you that you give me your righteousness, your cleansing. So Jesus, help me take your hand right now and follow you today and every day of my life and for eternity to be in your presence. And Lord Jesus, for all of us here, help us walk in community that shows the world that you are real. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. And everyone said... Amen.